Hey, and welcome to the very first uh, live stream here on Motormouth Canada. Now, for uh, quite a few years, I've been doing question and answers. People send in the questions, I do them on video, and then I upload them to YouTube, and that's been really good. But I thought I would uh, start by doing it live, and this is the very first one. So uh, if there's any technical glitches, um, you can put them in the comments below or on the live chat if you like. I've been working on getting this all straight uh, throughout the day today, so it's a real learning curve for me to be using uh, this uh, open broadcast uh, software. Um, I had the, the image looking really nice and crisp, and something's changed, and I've gone through all the settings, and I can't figure it out. So please uh, bear with me. I want you to come back, and I'm going to try and do this every single week. Um, I'm shooting for Mondays uh, because um, um, why not? and they're good for the whole week. If you miss them live, they're going to be uh, you know, kept here on YouTube for you to watch later. Now, I travel an awful lot, like I'm off to Spain tomorrow morning uh, for the launch of the Audi A8. So I'll shoot for Mondays, but if I'm traveling, I'll give you lots of notice and let you know if uh, at the time and the date changes for you to be able to uh, get on stream live and comment and um, people are already starting to come in here. So uh, we have Akash, uh, Raj is here, Tech Follower, Stephen Clinton, uh, Mazumel Hogg, and Yellow Fellow, and also Jack Castles. Uh, Brad Ghosh is here. So lots of people are, are getting in on the live stream. Now, a couple of things I want to talk about before we get uh, to the question and answer. Uh, yeah, this is going to be a regular feature. And uh, because it's the very first one, I just came back from the, um, the Honda Accord launch and they gave us this nice parting gift. It's a Honda backpack leather here, nice uh, plaid or tartan stitching, whatever you want to call it. Um, so in order to win this, I'm going to give this away today and ship it off to you in the mail. Uh, what I want you to do is go to my website and here it is here. Uh, you go to motormouth.ca and you click on the contact tab in the upper right there uh, up here and you can see um, where you can enter and I'll pick one lucky person uh, later tonight and I will announce it on the next show but you'll be getting this backpack really nice backpack looks really cool it's kind of like the Herschel ones it's not made by Herschel but but similar you know it's got that really kind of uh, earthy look to it. So I think that's a really cool thing to give away for our very first show. Uh, we're going to play some games as well. Uh, I was at the Honda Accord launch and talking to people at dinner about the different cars that Honda has and the hottest car probably to hit the market in the last little while is, uh, is this little car here, uh, the Civic Type R. And so I posed the question at dinner, which would you rather have? The, you know, just over 300 horsepower, front wheel drive, Honda Civic or this car, 292 horsepower, Golf R. What are the differences? Well, one comes down to looks. This one has the hot hatch thing going all day long. Golf R is really uh, quite subtle and uh, is a car that you can uh, definitely not, uh, sorry, it's a car you can definitely go under the radar. So uh, get your, um, comments in on that and we'll uh, we'll go through it so there's lots of people coming in oh there everyone's saying golf r focus rs uh golf r uh sti definitely would be a good choice i was going to put the wrx in there because uh, wrx has uh, less horsepower than both around 264 i believe but it's all-wheel drive as well all right so uh let's go into some of the questions and see um, which, uh, what people are looking for. So Akash Raj says, which is better, Mazda 3 GT Premium uh, or a Honda Civic? I get a lot of these questions, you know, people are saying, which one would I choose? And, and they're, they're very different cars. Uh, the one thing about the Mazda 3 is it is kind of getting old now. Uh, it's been out, it's been on the same platform and uh, they have been making them for, for quite a few years. Uh, the Civic obviously is the newer and the latest car. I think it's got much better in-dash technology. It's got Android um, Auto, Apple CarPlay. It's got all, all the latest advanced safety features available on most trims. And um, I think that um, when you compare them, they're both going to be in the driver's category. Now there's more basic cars, like a Corolla is just basic transportation. But cars that are 
more driver oriented, I would put the Golf, Mazda 3, and the Civic all in that camp. So yeah, what you need to do, and this is what I always encourage people to do, is go and try them out for yourself. <clears throat> now the one thing about the, um, the, the GT from the Mazda 3 is it's an automatic transmission. You could get manual on both, but automatic transmission in, uh, against the continuously variable in the Honda Civic is something you need to try to see if you can live with that. All right, somebody's saying uh, the screen looks okay on mobile. That's good. I'm just going to get a drink of water here. <coughs> Excuse me. I was mentioning off the top, if you're just catching up now, that I was having issues with the stream today. I spent a lot of time, you know, screwing around with the resolution, trying to get it right. So hopefully it looks good. Um, and uh, we'll get to more questions here. What's your education background? Well, I uh, came up um, uh, through broadcasting. I uh, went through broadcasting school for radio. I worked in radio for many, many years. I worked in television for many years. I did morning TV for 10 years. And through all that time when I was working on radio and television, I always had a side uh, deal as an auto reviewer. I actually started reviewing cars on uh, the radio, believe it or not. And then I switched to television and newspapers. And I've been doing this for a long time. Since uh, 1992 was the very first year I uh, started reviewing cars. So it's been a long time and I've driven a lot of cars. And um, so I guess my education is the fact that I get in and out of anywhere between you know 60 and 100 different cars a year. All right, um, Brad Ghosh says, uh, thoughts on the Audi S4 for Calgary winter driving. Well, the A4 is right up there with one of my top favorite cars that I've driven over the last 18 months or so. I would say that the, uh, the C-Class for Mercedes-Benz and the A4 are really the cars that are in the lead right now when it comes to that sort of compact premium space. Uh, the A4 though, that beautiful 252 horsepower engine and the lighter body, it just has great dynamics and I think it really kind of moves to the top of the class. It's got wonderful looking dashboard with all kinds of technology in there as well. When you get the S4, uh, you go up to a whole different level. So yeah, you've got the all wheel drive and if you can afford the S4, it's a hell of a car and you just need to put the proper tires on it. Had a neighbor, by the way, bought an A4 last year and he went for the S line and we were just about to get snow. And I said to him, well, do you have winter tires for this car? He goes, I don't, I don't need winter tires before for. I said, well, you got the S line. So that means you have straight performance summer tires. And he wasn't aware of that. Uh, we went and looked at the car and sure enough, straight summer tires. He thought he had all seasons. So one thing, if you're gonna go and you're gonna get a car, uh, with a performance package, a second set of wheels and tires are probably a good way to go. Uh, somebody's pointing out, happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, here in Canada, if you're watching in the United States, our Thanksgivings, by the way, Canada and the U.S. used to be the same. If you do a little, uh, uh, you know, wiki um, research on Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving has moved around many, many different times uh, through the decades, and we used to be synced up with the United States, and then Canada moved our Thanksgiving to be earlier. So we're, we're having Thanksgiving weekend now, and in the U.S. you have it in um, December. All right, um, there's so many people that have jumped on here. Somebody said, um, would you pick the Audi A4 for your luxury pick for sports sedan? What's your fave? As I just mentioned, I think the A4 goes to the top of the class. Uh, there's, there's lots of great cars in the compact premium space, but the A4 really is fantastic. So let's put the question out again. Um, I was asking, you know, we were at dinner at the Honda Accord launch in, in uh, Jasper, Alberta. And the video, by the way, is on the channel and it's doing very well. A lot of people are really interested in the new Accord versus the new Toyota Camry because both of these midsize sedans have come out uh, really within a couple of months of each other. Um, the Camry's trying to be much more upscale and sporty. They've got two kind of lines there. And Accord certainly has a different look. And as I mentioned, I'm um, giving away this backpack. All you need to do, it's uh, from Honda, they had uh, that as a handout, is go to my website, which is motormouth.ca. And it, when you're on the website, go to the contact tab, send in your information, and somebody's going to win this backpack um, later tonight. Now, the question came up at dinner. We were talking about the, uh, the Type R from Honda with the Honda Civic. 
and I brought up, you know, what's the counterpoint to that car would say be the Golf R, the WRX for sure, and the STI. So these are your polar opposites when it comes to what you're looking for. One is, you know, really goes under the radar and this one uh, certainly doesn't. So uh, what are your thoughts as we go through uh, the chat box? Most people are choosing the Golf R, some people the STI, um, some people are saying the Focus RS, and uh, that's really good. Um, somebody asked, should I get the Leaf or wait for the new Leaf or get the, uh, the e-Golf? Now, one of the things about the e-Golf, which I liked, is that the e-Golf is the top range car in the Volkswagen Golf line. If you get the Golf R or the e-Golf, they have the most advanced in-dash technology, the biggest screens, that digital dashboard, only available in the R and the e-Golf. So the one nice thing about the e-Golf, if you go and check it out, and I know supply is very limited right now, um, Volkswagen opened up uh, orders for this car and they were thinking they were going to sell you know, a few hundred of them and they got many more reservations than that for the car. <clears throat> one of the things is when you get into that car, it feels like the highest level Golf that you can buy. When you get into some other electric cars, they feel like the discount bargain brands. Nothing against the Chevy Bolt. I think it's a wonderful car and could definitely be in my top five cars that I drove over the last 12 months because the technology is fabulous and the range is excellent. I got about 440 kilometers of range out of that car when it's uh, rated at 383. Uh, so yes, it does all that it's supposed to do very, very well. However, the interior and the dash is really cheap and it doesn't feel like a 40 plus thousand dollar car. When you get in the Golf, the e-Golf, you get in and you go, I'm actually getting a vehicle that looks like the price point that's being charged. And it starts at about 36, 37,000 in Canada. So the best thing to do is to wait for the, um, the LEAF to show up. I am going to be going to the launch of the LEAF in California in December. So um, I would hold off judgment until I drive it. But uh, definitely it's uh, interesting for people who are looking at getting uh, an electric car. All right, what are other people saying here? When will you be reviewing the second generation Mazda CX-5? Excellent point. I've got to get that booked in. There's only 52 weeks in the year and, and sometimes like this week, sorry, not this week, next week, I've got three cars booked um, for the week. So to get in and out of them, it takes time. But yes, noted, I will get on the CX-5 and I agree with you. Um, all right. Um, somebody points out, uh, Ian, Ian Willis says the Golf R will have significantly more torque and offline acceleration compared to the Type R. You'd have to do a back to back on that. For me, it comes down to the design. You know, I'm not 22 anymore. If I was 22, the probably, I probably would never have been into the Type R. It's not my style of car with all the wings on it. I never really liked the big shopping cart handle on the back. I always thought it, you know, and some people have said, well, it's all there for aerodynamic effect. You know, come on, Zach, and that's what it's there for. It's a 300 horsepower car. It's not an 800 horsepower car. You get a 300 horsepower a Boxster or Cayman, it doesn't have wings all over it. Uh, and it's very capable of going fast and probably faster and handles better than a Type R. So you don't need all of those wings and fins and things on the Type R to make it go fast. Other manufacturers have much higher horsepower cars without all of that stuff and uh, they can hustle around a uh, racetrack or road no problem. So that's why for me and my taste it would be Golf R. But I can totally see somebody that's younger and loves all that stuff um, might want to go for that. Best small SUV, CX-5, Tiguan or CRV? Well these really are very different products. Um, the Tiguan is really quite big now, uh, the CX-5 is quite small, and uh, the CRV is right in the middle there. CRV has been a favorite in Canada. One you didn't include there is um, the Toyota RAV4, which has the sort of oldest technology and the most reliable technology. So if it was just for reliability, I'd say get a Toyota RAV4 all day long. If you're looking for the best 
handling, I would say CX-5. And if you're looking for a good all-rounder, it's kind of in between, the CRV is definitely the way to go. So the Tiguan is, is quite big and it has that optional third row seat. And watch the review, it's on the channel. Uh, my wife and I did it together about a week or so ago and a lot of people have been interested in that car. Somebody said, uh, Femi, did you really like the Cadillac CT6? Absolutely. We went on a family road trip up to the Okanagan and back. It was about, um, altogether, about 1,600 kilometers. And, uh, no, sorry, not that many, about, about 1,000 kilometers. And the more I drove the CT6 with a 3-liter twin turbo, the more I liked it. It's the uh, rear steering and uh, the steering feel of the car and the magnetic ride control. It all came together to produce a very worthwhile road car and it's lighter than much of its competition. So go back and watch the review on the channel of the CT6. I really did enjoy it. I think um, General Motors is doing a lot of things really well right now. They're doing um, lightweight vehicles, smaller engines, powerful engines. Um, you can watch the review I did of the GMC Terrain. It's a really good product and the quality of these cars has come way up from where they were years ago. All right, let's look uh, more here. Um, your thoughts on the lower open grille design of the 2018 Accord. So somebody's watched the video, and I encourage you to go and watch the video of the Honda Accord, because at the bottom of the grill, it looks like a piece is missing. Now, the way we shot the car was in direct sunlight, and you could kind of see through the bottom. In typical daylight, you couldn't. And and the other thing is that uh, for aesthetics and for video and for pictures, they didn't put license plates on the front of the car, which makes a marked difference in the way that it looks. So go back and watch the Honda Accord video that I just posted yesterday. It's doing very well, getting lots of views. And, and when you see that lower part of the grill, and some people have made note of that, that it looks like there's a piece missing, I think it's the way that we shot the car and also the fact that it didn't have a license plate. What is the threshold size for an SUV to be considered midsize or compact? <clears throat> now, a lot of these uh, vehicles, if you just measure interior volu volume, the official way to measure a car is interior volume, compact, midsize, what have you. Now, a lot of the compact utilities are based on compact cars. For example, the CRV has always been built off the Civic platform. Uh, years ago, uh, when the RAV4 first came out, it was built off the um, Celica platform, believe it or not. So, and, and a lot of the reason why some are called compact and some are midsize, it's not the length, it's the width. So if you get in a smaller utility, side to side it's narrower, and then you get in a larger utility, often it's the width, it's the track of the wheels. But the official way to decide whether a vehicle is, is compact, midsize, or full size is interior volume. But the way it really comes down is the price point. So the manufacturers are focusing larger vehicles in a less expensive uh, category. One perfect example of that is the, is the Sorento. It actually is a little bit bigger than most of its co competition, but the price point starts and competes with the compact utilities. So it is confusing, and I know a lot of people say, how is the Atlas a midsize utility? Well, it competes on price with other midsize utility. It doesn't compete with full-size SUVs. Um, Mark, when is the uh, CX-5 coming in diesel? That's a very good question. Um, it is coming, and that's good news for people who are fans of diesel. I have a diesel Audi. I love it. Love to get another diesel. Um, Volkswagen's out of the game altogether. Audi and Porsche sort of all out of it. Mercedes-Benz isn't selling diesels anymore. So your options to get a utility are the Equinox, from Chevy, the GMC Terrain, and the upcoming CX-5 in diesel. So it is coming um, when I'm not exactly sure, but that's going to be a vehicle that is really going to be a lot of fun to try and see how refined it is. They spent a long time. I was at a, a, 
uh, Mazda Forum here in Vancouver. They shipped over a bunch of early prototype uh, Mazda 6 diesels and Mazda CX-5 diesels. This is probably five years ago now. They had a worldwide forum here. They flew in journalists from all over the world here to Vancouver and we all got a chance to drive these what are called mules. They were the engines, the newer engines and the older bodies and uh, that was years ago and they said they were going to be developing the diesel engine. Now the big problem as we all know is getting the tailpipe emissions down, the nitrous oxide. So that's what they've been working on. They have a revolutionary design and we're going to get our hands on it uh, soon. Do you recommend Jiffy Lube for oil changes? Um, I don't like the quick, it's nothing against Jiffy Lube or Mr. Lube or whoever it is or any of these quickie places. The problem you have is, is none of them are, um, you know, certified mechanics, Red Seal certified. They are a lot of times people are just starting out in the mechanics field. They don't have a lot of experience and if they make a mistake and they get it wrong and things do happen, um, it's not the best. The best way to get an inexpensive oil change is to find um, and a sort of an independent mechanic shop somewhere. You know, you don't have to go to your dealer to get your oil changed. You have to be able to record the fact that you did get the uh, service done and to do what is recognized in the owner's manual, but you don't have to go to the dealer to keep your warranty up and you can go to independent mechanics. For example, say you own a Honda. So the best thing to do is to type into Google and say, where are the best, um, you know, Honda, uh, mechanics in your town and find somebody and, and go there. Somebody that has experience with your model of car and get them to do it. They might have a new sort of apprentice mechanic doing the oil changes but I still think that's better than a lot of these quickie places. Um, I've heard some bad stories. I've used them in the past. I have absolutely but um, it depends also on the value of your car. If you don't really care go but um, there you go. Those are my thoughts. Hey, ever going to come to Cambridge, Ontario? Yeah, we had a, a RAV4 event at the factory down there in uh, Toyota in Cambridge. That was a couple of years ago, but I uh, haven't been back since. Have you seen the Honda Clarity yet? That's the plug-in hybrid and then the hydrogen vehicle. I've driven the hydrogen vehicle. Same thing, they brought one from Japan and we had a chance to drive it here in Vancouver. But um, yeah, this future technology, uh, gonna it's a wait and see game. A lot of times uh, the vehicles get announced and then you wait and you wait and you wait to get into them. Uh, Jude just wrote, I work for Toyota. When will you come to Montreal? I was in Montreal recently. I get invited to go to Montreal all the time. And um, um, that's great. Uh, it's great going to Montreal. It's a great town. Uh, not so much in the winter, but it's one of my favorite places uh, to go in Canada for sure. And if you've never been to uh, Quebec, you you owe it to yourself to go and it absolutely is worthwhile visiting in the winter especially to go to old Quebec City and Montreal uh, I think it's really a wonderful place to go plan to review the Kia Stinger the invite from Kia just came this week uh, it's the 15th of November I might have a conflict so I might not be able to go and uh, I, I hope to because I think that car is going to be something to drive does the cruise diesel make sense? It's very pricely for a small car. That comes from David Kelly. Well, these things all come down to how much you drive. If you drive a lot and you can utilize the efficiency of a diesel, diesel is really one of the best ways to get the best fuel economy out of a car outside of a hybrid. Um, and if you do a lot of highway driving, absolutely. Uh, go and try it. The engine is maybe the quietness inside the cabin isn't refined as, as we had expected expected but um, a lot of it comes down to a trade-off between how much noise there is in the cabin versus the amount of efficiency if you're somebody that's like say for example in sales and you're driving all over say southwestern Ontario and you can utilize the efficiency of that car why not get a diesel Uh, what's your first impression of the new Audi A8? Well, I was in Spain in June and they unveiled the Audi A8 and I'm going this week. I'm going back to Spain tomorrow. I take off, I fly to uh, Toronto and then fly overnight to Munich and then we're catching a flight down to Seville in Spain and driving the A8. So I'll give you my 
driving impressions, here's the thing, the Audi A8 and the Porsche Panamera now have a lot of shared components. Pretty much the same vehicle when you look at um, uh, the platform, then engines, and even the in-dash technology. Uh, I think it's really quite conservatively styled for my taste. I wish they took a little bit bolder approach with the A8. So if you're somebody that can't get your head around the Panamera, the A8 is definitely an option. But I will have a video of the car by next weekend. How much do you make a year before taxes? Millions, absolutely, of pennies. What is the best time of year to buy a car? Kindly share your thoughts and factors. Um, all right. Here's a perfect example. When a vehicle is being discontinued or a new model is coming out, that's the best time to strike and, and go for it. For example, the new Camry is coming, the new Accord, the new Camry is arriving now, and the new Accord is coming in the next few weeks. If you really are not crazy about having the newest and the latest, you're more motivated about getting the best deal, then look for those last model year cars. 2017 Camry and Accord, they're going to have discounts on them, they're going to want to build the inventory down, and you're going to get the best deal on the very last of the old model. Now when the new model shows up, you're not going to get discounts, there's going to be people wanting to get it, trading it in. So whenever a model is changing from one model to the next, not just model year, but a whole new model, another one we saw some great deals on the Chevy Equinox. They were really sort of uh, building down that inventory on dealers' lots, throwing cash on the hood because a new Equinox was coming. Now it might be a little delayed because of the strike in Ontario, but um, yes, that's when you get the best deal. Now generally, if it's not a brand new model coming out, we're heading into the time of year now. So you hear those ads on the radio, you see those print ads in the newspaper and online that say the new models are coming, the 18s have arrived, we need to get rid of the 17s. So now you start to get good deals. As you head towards the end of the calendar year, that's when they really want to get rid of them because as soon as it ticks over to January 1, that vehicle is now officially one year old. So they have to discount it even more. What happens though, it's a kind of an inverse curve. As you go towards the new year, there's less and less inventory available so you might be able to go onto a dealer's lot and they might have a blue a red a green a yellow and all different trim uh, configurations but as you get towards the end of the year the deals might get greater but your selection what's available on the lot diminishes so it's a bit of a waiting game and every single month there's new deals so as we head towards uh, Halloween and into November the manufacturers and the dealers will come out with what is the new incentive. It, it might go from $3,000 off to $3,500 off and 0% interest and a free trip to Hawaii or something like that. Those are the things that come. When you see those ads that comes from the manufacturer. For example, if you see an ad for Honda Accord discounted 2017, say it's $3,000 off, that comes from Honda Canada. So also go in and ask the dealer for what they're going to give you off the top. It might not be cash, but you can say, hey, why don't you throw in um, a spare set of wheels and winter tires? Or why don't you get them to me at your cost? Or why don't we get some free oil changes or something like that. There's definitely negotiations. So the trifecta I like to call it is you get a rebate from the manufacturer, you get a discount from the dealer, and you get that cheap money, the 0% interest, 1.9% interest. If you can do that, that's when you get the best deal. Uh, somebody says, uh, thanks for doing the great reviews and quality videos. Mike Gurr is doing a fantastic job. So those of you who uh, watch regularly know Mike is the uh, latest um, person to join the Motormouth Canada team. It's just the two of us. My wife helps now and again uh, doing some videos. But Mike absolutely is doing a great job. The one thing about Mike, I had uh, an open audition. People sent in videos and I looked at them all and his really right away stood out above everybody else's. He was able to come up with an idea, articulate it, and when you watch his video reviews, that's the, the great thing about Mike. He's got a totally different way of speaking than anybody that I watch doing car reviews. Certainly different than me. He's got a very polished, and the one thing about Mike, because we, we you know text back and forth, he's meticulous. He likes it to be perfect, so he really puts a lot of effort into the videos, and I can appreciate that. And I think he's having fun. He's having some fun cars to drive. But for a guy who's never done this, any aspect of it, it's amazing to see how good he is right out of the gate. My only thing is hopefully he's going to stick around. 
Um, which is better, uh, Paul plays Minecraft, Honda Santa Fe Sport or Honda Odyssey as a family vehicle? Well, there is no better family vehicle than a minivan. So there's your answer. Honda Odyssey without a heartbeat is the better family vehicle. Which one's nicer to drive and own? Well, that's a totally different scenario. You really need to, depending on your situation, get in and out of them. Uh, if you've got kids and car seats and strollers and dogs and all that, you need to try the vehicles in those situations. A lot of people buy a car, then they email and they see me, Zach, I got this car, I don't like it, it doesn't work for me. Well, did you test drive it? You would be shocked by how many people buy a car and don't test drive the car. It's absolutely unbelievable. So you really need to go and take your family and, and try out both vehicles and see what works for you. Somebody just wrote here, Paul and Rebecca said, uh, not sure if you covered this, Porsche BMW to stop European delivery, a new law. That's a real shame. I haven't heard that. I'll have to look into that. Uh, so historically, if you bought a Porsche or a BMW, you could pick it up at the factory and have it insured. Typically, I think it was for two weeks. And then you could travel around Europe in your new car. What a way to get a car, right? And then uh, you drop it off at the port and you fly home. And then, uh, you know, a couple months later, your car arrives. And for many manufacturers, it was actually cheaper to do the European delivery. So uh, I have to look into that. I think it would be a real shame because it's, it's been one of my dreams is to order a new Porsche 911, to go to, uh, to, go to pick it up at the factory, to drive it all through Europe, drop it off, and then fly home. So I hate to see if that comes to an end. Um, how come we don't have more choices for affordable and premium compact hybrid SUVs? Well, it all comes down to uh, the, the amount of money that it takes to go into producing these cars, the technology. So for many manufacturers to put the advanced uh, electronics into the vehicles, the batteries, you know, the great thing about Toyota and the reason why they're so good at it is they've been doing hybrids the longest. They have the same platform and uh, system that they use for many different vehicles. They brought out the hybrid system in the NX and sure enough because the NX and the RAV4 share the same platform, they were able to plummet into the RAV4. So you're going to start to see more of this. Toyota has said they want to have a hybrid in every vehicle that they sell. I think the big one for them and I think they could come out and I think it probably is going to be in the future will be the new Sienna minivan because Chrysler came out and made a lot of noise about their hybrid minivan which by the way is excellent if you ever get a chance to drive it the hybrid Pacifica minivan is very good the big knock against it is 55 grand for a minivan no chance I'd pay that but a good product so if Toyota puts the same hybrid system they have in um, the Highlander into the Sienna well, that's a real great family vehicle that's efficient as well. Somebody, um, somebody said, why do people like SUVs? I'd rather drive a donkey. That's Mark uh, Rambold. What are you going to do? It replaces the station wagon. I mean, a lot of it comes down to women have tried SUVs and they love them. And a big part of it is they sit up a little bit higher. You have no idea how empowering that is to be able to see over top of cars. I have a theory about this. I think the people that tailgate the worst are people in SUVs because they can see past you so they get right up behind you. If you sit in a sports car, if you've ever driven in like a small sports car like a like a, an S2000 or a Miata or a Porsche, you sit so low and what happens is when you sit low you have to actually sit back farther behind the car in front of you to see around them. When you sit up higher, you can get right up on someone's bumper and see over top of them. So sitting lower actually forces you to sit back, which is safer. Um, so yeah, I, I get it why people like the SUV and they like the all wheel drive and they, it's basically just the modern version of the station wagon. That's it. My, my thing here is flipping around. Um, Adnan says, Hey Zach, nine-year-old is your biggest fan. His name is Azhan. Can you please say hi? Izhan would be thrilled. There you go, buddy. Uh, I love it that um, he's nine years old and he's into cars. That's a big problem for the auto industry, you know, that car companies are having a hard time getting young people excited about cars. 
They, a lot of people who maybe are starting out don't have the money, they don't want to buy a new car, and if they buy a new car, it's a bit of a grudge purchase. When I was a kid, it was all about getting your license, and every single time I buy a car, I'm always thinking about what the next car is. It's an addiction, um, but a lot of young people today aren't into it. They're into their electronics and their phones. Cars are a grudge purchase, which I think is sad. So it's nice that there's still a core group of young people that like cars. Um, Got Coke says Audi Q7, so they're obviously looking for a three-row SUV. Mercedes GLS or X5, which luxury SUV comes out on top? I think it's the Q7. The GLS is a wonderful product, however, it's no longer available with the diesel. Same thing with the Q7, but um, uh, the GLS, um, I've heard a lot of people with issues with those products um, so it's I know it's it's not hard and fast information but sort of grandmother research secondary secondhand uh, tells me that there have been people with issues with those products I'd love for people to chime in but the new Q7 really is the newest and the latest in that class and uh, the X5 is getting old and the back third row seat is like a torture chamber don't want to put maybe your mother-in-law back there Toyota needs to re redesign the Sequoia. It's so old. Absolutely. The Sequoia is old. The Tundra is old. And I think there's a new product coming very soon. Stay tuned. Do you think the next uh, Rogue will be a plug-in? Um, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I think that we're going to see more and more and more of this. As we're racing, everybody's racing towards electrification. I think that you're going to see more hybrids and more electrics. The difference is how many people are going to buy them. Now, the one thing I should point out is the Ford Escape was the best-selling compact utility in Canada. And then Toyota came out with the RAV4 hybrid. And now the RAV4, when you take gas and hybrid, is the best-selling small utility in Canada. So it proves that people, first of all, will spend quite a bit. It starts at 35 grand for the hybrid, but it's a Toyota, so you're going to get a lot of that money back. You're going to get a lot of money back in fuel savings. And uh, you know, if it's done right, and they've done it right with the RAV4, it shows uh, why uh, you can do it and you can get people excited. Unfortunately, if you're not Toyota, that's synonymous with hybrid, a lot of these vehicles kind of just sit on vehicles' lots. You seem to have a different opinion on the Lincoln Continental to your wife. Why? Well, I'll tell you, you can go and watch the Lincoln Continental review. Uh, we drove that same trip I talked about earlier with the CT6 with the Lincoln Continental and booked it in specifically because I wanted a big sedan for a long trip with what we thought were going to be comfortable seats and those hyper adjustable power seats with 32 way adjustment or whatever after a while they weren't comfortable the back seat was hard my kids complained about it so it came down to comfort a big luxury sedan first and foremost should have comfortable seats now the Lincoln has all the whiz bang stuff but really not that comfortable what are your thoughts on station wagons love station wagons I uh, had a BMW uh, 5 series station wagon thought it was great oh uh, Adnan says thanks for the shout out thanks for that uh, which station wagon would you recommend well, there's uh, less and less of them out there in the marketplace. You can see brands like Subaru, they take what was a legacy station wagon and they put cladding on it, they raise it up, and, uh, and they call it the Outback, and now you can't even get a legacy. You have to get the Outback. So that's the way it's going. You know, the Audi A4 Avant's a nice car, but there's so few station wagons out there. The new uh, Alltrack from Volkswagen is a very nice option, uh, but you, you, know, you don't have to get that. You can just get the regular sport wagon. Do you ride motorcycles? I don't. No, not safe in this part of the world. If you've driven around here, you know what I'm saying. Do you think hydraulic steering will make a comeback due to better steering feel? Which cars have, um, have the good steering feel? Uh, the thing is, the electric power steering systems are getting better and better and better. For example, in the Porsche products, you get what's called an electromechanical um, power steering. Uh, the new Accord that I just drove this past week, electric power steering was fantastic. So, like everything, 
the electric power steering systems were really crude. They were dead and sloppy on center. They didn't feel good. You had to correct them all the time. Now they're getting to the point where they're really quite good. And it really comes down to vehicle and brand specific. But I could put you in a new car and, t and not to say what kind of system it is, and you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference. The other thing is, if you get into a car and you drive it for a couple of weeks, the body has the ability to adjust to the steering. So your style adjusts to whatever vehicle you have. I mean, I drive different cars every week and I adjust to every different one. So I think that um, um, it really is a, a kind of a moot point now. I think that they're much getting much, much better and the, as the years go by, you're gonna to start to see better and better electric power steering systems. What is your experience with uh, German cars, are they reliable? Well, German cars are wonderful. I'm a German car fan. I have had many German cars, mostly German cars. I have a, I have a Toyota Tacoma pickup truck. I've had a Toyota Celica. I've had uh, a lot of Volkswagens. But German cars, to me, are the, are the forerunners in terms of technology, driving dynamics and handling. However, they can be expensive to fix. I could show you all my bills over the years. Um, but I think that some brands are doing better than others. Porsche's at the top. Lexus and Porsche battle it out for the quality scores every single year. So if you buy a Porsche, you're getting a very high quality product, regardless if it's German or not. Other brands that do well, above average, uh, Audi has above average quality. Mercedes-Benz as a brand has above average quality. Volkswagen is just still slightly below average and you look at J.D. Power and Associates uh, initial quality and long-term dependability. But uh, my advice to anybody, if you have a, a very expensive German car and a technologically advanced German car, it's a great idea to have them under warranty as long as you can because um, and when they break, they can be very expensive. Now that being said, I had a Toyota once <clears throat> um, that I had to repair and do several things to it. And the parts were very expensive for Toyota. So uh, it all comes down to what your pain tolerance is. Somebody uh, writing in and saying, do you think that Toyota will add uh, Android Auto and Apple CarPlay? into their um, head units. Speaking with the executives at Toyota, the vice president, uh, Stephen Beattie, and the, and the product planners of the new Camry when we got uh, to drive it, they asked, I asked them point blank, I said, you know, you don't have Android Auto and Apple CarPlay in your head units across the Toyota lineup. There's a lot of people won't even consider you because of that. <coughs> Excuse me. So they said, we have the ability to add it as an app into their Entune system so I, I would almost guarantee you that that is going to be an option. You're going to start to see that because they're going to be forced to. They claim it's because of data breach that the phone uh, has the ability to transmit the data from the car out of the car back to who knows where. And that's why they're doing it. But um, uh, that's the reason why. It, but I bet you that it's going to change and they're going to be forced to put it in there. Hey, Zach. I think you're always so nicely well dressed. What kind of watch do you currently have on? Well, today I'm wearing um, my Explorer 2. And this watch here, that's my uh, Grail watch. That is a Patek Philippe Aquanaut in blue. Look that up. That's a heart stopper, the price. You could buy a new car for the price of that one. And a nice new car, too. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm a watch guy. I have another channel on YouTube. It's called uh, Watch This and uh, I do kind of reviews of watches. So uh, yeah, if you're into watches and a lot of people that are into cars are also into watches, uh, you can definitely surf over there and look up some of my hardware. What's better, an Acura RDX or a Subaru Forester? Well, I tell you what, that Subaru Forester Turbo, that thing's the bomb, it really, it goes. One is a premium product and one isn't. Now, the one knock on Subaru has been for many years is the interiors of their products 
are a little bit basic and in the Subaru's case I think quite a bit basic it could get better and you see with their newest latest products like the uh, the Crosstrek it's definitely improved their head units are looking much better and that's one shortfall as Subaru had was their radios were really kind of old and antiquated it was really hard to even play your Bluetooth stuff like that but if, if you're gonna get a Forester I strongly recommend if you can afford it to get the turbo at least take it out for a test drive you can say you can say I'm thinking about it but do yourself a favor it's a lot of fun to drive the Acura RDX is one of those blue chip products you can go and watch my review I like it because it's simple it's old technology you could buy it and drive it for 10 plus years with little muss or fuss it's got a bulletproof v6 it's got a bulletproof six-speed automatic transmission that's why I recommend that vehicle so often and you'll notice here on the channel I often go for the tried and true technology over the newest and the latest so back to the Honda Accord, Toyota Camry, the videos have both come out in the last little while and I even said at the end of the review. So you've got Toyota over here who's playing it conservative. They don't have turbocharged engines. They've got regular automatic transmission. We're over at Honda with the new Accord. They've got turbocharged engines. They've got CVTs. So this is sort of known, proven technology. This is new, advanced technology. Which one gets you going? Often, I would like the Accord, the styling and the interior better. But there's something about the engines and the transmissions that Toyota's using that are bulletproof. I mean, they're Toyota. They run forever. Um, Ajanth says, I'm 22, living in Toronto. What do you think of a six-speed BMW 328? Uh, would it be a nice purchase? Um, looking for something sporty and luxurious. Well, if you're 22 years old and you're looking at a BMW, you have... Trust me, I've been through this. They're easy to buy. It's a whole different story to maintain. So you have to, I would suggest on a car like that, have a budget of about $2,500 a year in maintenance to keep it running to the standard. Absolutely, it's a great car. You would have a load of fun with it. But at 22, it's about cash flow. I don't know what you do. You might be able to float that kind of uh, coin, but just be careful uh, that you're, it's easy to buy the car. It's a whole other thing to maintain it. It's a very good question, actually. If you were to choose between a fully loaded version of a regular brand versus uh, the premium brand, which would you go for? The, the examples here were the Land Cruiser or the LX560. Now, we don't get the Land Cruiser in Canada, but I get the comparison. Uh, we had a lot of people commenting on the Acura RDX video that I did saying, well, why wouldn't you just, because the RDX is based on the CRV, why wouldn't you just get a fully loaded CRV? Well, one thing is warranty. You get a year longer warranty typically with a premium car, four years versus three years. And there's more refinement many times when it comes to noise insulation you often will get things like laminated windshield uh, you get uh, more insulation in the car often it comes down to the noise in the car usually a greater list of standard features but sometimes you can get a few anomalies in there and the Land Cruiser would be a great explanation because you don't get the air suspension that you get in the Lexus which is maybe a bonus in the long run uh, it's a simpler more basic product versus the premium luxury brand and it's always something to compare uh, here's another perfect example the S3 from Audi versus the Golf R and when you look at those two cars, both built on the same platform, both all-wheel drive, both use the same engine. One's made by Audi, one's made by Volkswagen. The Volkswagen Golf R is the runaway choice. It just makes so much more sense. And I'm going with Audi tomorrow uh, on a trip to drive the new A A8, and I'm saying that to you because it's the truth. It is the one to get. All right. Um... This is Antoine Laporte. What are your thoughts on the long-term durability of the e-Golf? Uh, you know what? Electric cars have fewer components. Uh, there are still op there are still things that will wear. You know, you have brakes and you have um, you know electronic issues, uh, heating systems, all those sorts of things. But one of the great advantages to having an electric cars, there really are less things to break. So long-term reliability. 
I would, uh, I don't know off the top of my head, typically with new technology, um, I know our hybrids, for example, when Toyota brought them out, they had eight year warranties on the hybrid system versus just the typical three year bumper to bumper warranty. So check into that to see if Volkswagen offers a longer warranty. Plus you can buy an extended warranty on it. Uh, you know, it's something to consider, but yeah, I would think that the long term reliability would be as good, if not better, because there's less things to break on it. Do you think Toyota's coming out with a new redesigned 4Runner? Despite the rumors, they're discontinuing it. That comes from Got Coke. I think that, yeah, there are, they are going to come out with one. And I think that you're going to start to see um, the new truck line from Toyota coming out here in the next year. As I mentioned, Sequoia is ancient. Um, the Tundra, I really believe, needs an update, especially with engine technology. Their V8s are thirsty compared to the competition. And uh, there's another perfect example of the 4Runner could be built off the new uh, Tacoma platform with their 3.5 liter and also going to their D4S system with the engine. I think that's what they're going to do instead of maybe going build off a, a platform used in other parts of the world. Hey, Zach, are you going to do a review of the Tesla Model 3? Don't get me started on Tesla with their press cars. They're a horrible company to try to deal with, to try and get cars. They don't make it easy for us to get them. Uh, they put all kinds of parameters on how long you can have the car and what you can do with it. It's not, it's not um, like every other car manufacturer. They, they say that about themselves. They're different than everybody else. But you know what? Uh, there's going to be a time when they're going to need uh, the press to get out there, and they certainly have lots of fanboys. But the one thing I'll say about Tesla fan media outlets, a lot of them are uh, tech blogs and tech, tech outlets. They're not car people, not all of them, there's quite a few car people that review Teslas, but a lot of people just fawn over them that are technology people. Tesla doesn't run like a regular car company to its benefit, and I think maybe in the long run, maybe a little bit to its detriment. So yeah, maybe one day I'll get a Model 3. Um, it's not high on my list because I'm not chasing Tesla around to get one. If they want to make one available for me to drive, great. <clears throat> but I would email them and say, oh, I want to drive the Model S. Well, if you're in California, well, I'm coming to California. I'm going to be in L.A. Can I get a car? Well, you know, the closest one is three hours away and you can only have it for an hour. Well, I, I said, so I'm flying to California. I want to drive your car and you're only going to give it to me for an hour? I said, keep your car. And they finally got one. So um, it's, it's, it's its own animal, Tesla, and we'll see what happens. Um... Somebody said, what are your thoughts of the person who drove the CRV into the Simon Fraser University pond? Didn't hear about that one. Uh, but yeah, there's no lack of bad drivers in this town, I'll tell you. I live in Vancouver, by the way, for those that don't know. Um, do you think that the Infiniti Q50 is the best sedan for the Canadian weather in this price range? Any other recommendations? Q50 is a nice car. Uh, Mike Gurr, the other reviewer here on the channel, just did the Q60, the coupe version of the Q50. I do like the Q50 quite a bit. I think it's a nice product and they do offer a lot of bang for the buck. But I tell you, I watch uh, the deals that go on out there and, and there are some great deals that come up on the Audi A4. And if I was buying a premium compact sedan that was good in the winter, I, would, I wouldn't even hesitate. It would be an Audi A4. I think that is a wonderful car. All right. My, my feed keeps jumping around here, so I don't want to go back and, and, uh, and read the same thing over and over again. <clears throat> um, has your Tacoma been reliable? So my Tacoma is 10 years old. Yeah, 10 years old. It's got 200,000 kilometers on it. And uh, yeah, it's been great. I've only had it for a year. So, uh, and I got the base model. So 10 year, I, I specifically hunted for this car this truck. I wanted a four-cylinder, manual transmission, rear-wheel drive. I use it for going to the dump, to Home Depot. It's my kick-around town vehicle when uh, sometimes I don't have a, a car to drive. So um, yeah, that's why I bought it. Because I had a Volkswagen van for 13 years, an old Vanagon. Uh, I changed uh, the battery, master cylinder, and the exhaust on that in the 13 years, and I sold it for more than I paid for it. So uh, my little kick around car only gets about 1,000 to 2,000 kilometers driven on it uh, a year. So uh, I don't really put a lot of, uh, you know, miles on it as we go. Hey, here's a good one. 24-7 gaming. I'm 15 and approaching the age. 
I'm going to be able to drive. Should I learn to drive stick? Well, my oldest son is 15, and he'll be 16 next September. And we've had lots of talks about this in the family. His younger brother uh, will sit in the right-hand seat of uh, my old van or the, the Tacoma I just mentioned, and he does the shifting for me. So the great thing, I really think it is great. If you can get a manual and learn to drive on a manual, the one problem we have in society is that everybody's on their phone and they're texting. And if you drive a manual transmission, you don't have a lot of time to be grabbing your phone and texting. And the great thing is when you come up to an intersection and you stop, you're looking around at things differently when you drive a manual transmission than you are if you drive an automatic. You're looking at the light to the right, seeing when it turns yellow, knowing that your light's just about to turn green, put your clutch in, put it in first gear, gear, get ready to go. When the light turns green, well, because of that, you've already surveyed the whole intersection just because you drive a manual. And then that whole other compounding factor of, of the technology in the cars, it forces kids to put the phone down. And, it, and they say it's the best way to stop a car getting stolen is to put a manual in it because so many people don't know how to drive stick. So I think that's going to be the case in our house. We're going to get a manual transmission for, um, for our family. All right. Um, sorry, this thing's jumping around again. Somebody asks, uh, Sir Xenon, how reliable are the 3-liter Audi diesels and what do you think of the impact of the VW diesel gate on a decision to purchase a 14 uh, with that engine? Well, now you're getting to a vehicle that's going to be four years old. If you're heading into 2018, it's going to be coming off warranty, so you might want to get an extended warranty on it. We still don't have the official fix for the 3-liter diesels. I have one of these, uh, so the diesel has not been settled in Canada yet. Uh, for the 3-liter for the Volkswagen, Porsche, and Audi uh, larger vehicles. So that's still to come. Uh, I'm sitting on tender hooks wondering what's going to happen with our Audi 3-liter diesel. Uh, I think it's a great engine. I, we have it in our car, our A7, and it is wonderful. It delivers amazing fuel economy. Here's a perfect example. Left downtown Seattle. I uh, waited till dinner was done because if anybody's been to Seattle, traffic's horrible. Jumped on the I-5 around 8 o'clock at night, came up the I-5. I'll put it this way. I was maybe going over the speed limit a little bit. I got to my front door in my house two hours and 15 minutes later. So you can figure out how fast I was going. Family of four, loaded down, all of the suitcases, everybody in the car, hammering up the I-5. I used six liters per 100 kilometers and only used an eighth of a tank of fuel. So I'm a huge fan. And the torque is second to none. 428 pound-feet of torque, it's, it's fantastic. Do you think that Fiat is more reliable now compared to other brands? That comes from uh, Jude. Uh, if you look at the ratings, it, it's not really proving out to be the case. Uh, you see that uh, still Chrysler, uh, the FCA brands are still below industry average. Jeep is coming up. Jeep is specific too to the model. I think the Grand Cherokee, I heard from the head of automotive from J.D. Power and Associates when I was doing my radio show here in Vancouver. Uh, he said the Grand Cherokee is a reliable product. So it's, it's really brand specific. I take my dog for a walk every day. There's a guy who's got a Fiat, um, what does he have? A Fiat 500X. And he says it's been in the shop many, many times. So, uh, yeah, it's not, they're not where the others are, and they need to improve that. Uh, all right, any recommendations for a small SUV under $35,000 uh, for a non car savvy person? Re reliability is a must. Um, well, if it's reliability, get a RAV4. You get the RAV4, I think it's the XLE, I think it's 28 or 29,000. Buy that, you'll be happy. Why are there no car company that does any kind of publicity for their battery electric vehicles? Most of them uh, now produce battery electric vehicles or will soon. Um, it doesn't sound like they're pushing hard to get onto the technology. Well, one of the things is that they're making so few of them. Um, they're not pushing them because the numbers are very small. So, for example, a couple of hundred 
e-golfs have been sold in Canada. Uh, the bolt is just starting to trickle in. So the numbers aren't there. And I, I think that as they have the capacity to produce more, and they're basically producing for the demand. So as people put their hands up and go to the dealer and say, I want a battery electric car, they're producing to that scale. Uh, I think the car manufacturers are doing what I've been saying. Um, you know, that old movie, uh, Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. There's a real worry and you talk to the manufacturers, hey, we're going to build all these electric cars. What if nobody comes? And that's a real worry. So that's the reason why they're scaling slowly to the demand. They're not producing tens of thousands of them and then just have them sitting on lots and having to discount them. So that's the real issue. All right, I am going really long here. And I just wanted to let you know that if you um, want to win, oh, I'll show you the bag again. If you want to win this bag, it's a Honda bag, I got it upside down, a Honda backpack that was given to me as a parting gift um, from the Accord launch that happened in Jasper. Go to my website, motormouth.ca, and click on uh, the contact tab, get your information in, and I'll draw a name, and I'll have uh, that shipped out to you uh, as soon as I can. So. That's the very first live stream. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Lots of great questions. If I didn't get to yours, I apologize. I'm gonna be doing this every single week. I'm hoping to do them on Mondays. As I mentioned, I travel a lot. I'm going to the Audi A8 event in Spain, leaving tomorrow. Then I'm home for a week. Then I go to drive the new Porsche Cayenne. Uh, that's in Greece, believe it or not. And then there's trips to drive the new Leaf in California. There's the new Mustang uh, uh, event that's going to be in California. I'm going to the LA Auto Show. I'm going to drive the Mitsubishi Eclipse Sport down there. And then there's another uh, vehicle that I'm... Oh, there's a new Infiniti crossover coming out. I'm going to the launch of that. So I travel all the time. So I'm going to try and do it on Mondays. But if not, I'll give you advance warning when the show is going to be up. But thank you to everybody for the comments. Thanks for taking part. I'll see you next time. And... Um, have a great night, and for the Canadians that are watching, happy Thanksgiving.